Goedenavond, good evening. I will speak English so that our guest uh, can understand me. My name is uh, Philippe van Houten. I represent the Center for Contemporary European Philosophy of this university, CCEP, that uh, organizes together with Red Proud Reflects uh, the, uh, this evening. And so we are very happy that we could invite for tonight uh, Severine Kodjo, that she could accept uh, that she could accept our, our invitation to speak at the occasion of the fifth anniversary, anniversary of our CCP. Um, the Center for Contemporary European Philosophy started some years ago a research line, as they call it these days, a research line on intercultural uh, philosophy. And in that context, and some of you might have participated to these events. In that context, we already invited a number of people. Uh, I only mention a few. Uh, Bashir Diagne uh, gave a talk on philosophy in Islam. Ibrahim Atyoub spoke on the history of slavery. And last uh, May, we had uh, Felwin Sarr from the University of uh, Université Saint, uh, Gaston Berger of Saint Louis, who spoke about his book Afrotopia. And I'm very happy to be able to announce that the same CCP uh, will uh, translate Afrotopia. And the book will be published normally in April in Dutch. Now, this um, we invited uh, Severin Kojo for this uh, fifth anniversary to indicate the importance that the CCP gives to intercultural philosophy. That is to the need to broaden our philosophical pers uh, perspectives beyond our own uh, culture. Severin uh, Kojo is a philosopher and a journalist. She um, was responsible for many years of the cultural pages of Jeune Afrique. And at the moment she works at, uh, uh, at, uh, for, the new, for the French newspaper Le Monde. But she is in this context, above all, the author of a very interesting book on African philosophies, Af philosophy african, uh, philosophy in the plural. Um, it's a very interesting book. For those who read French, I can recommend it, and I hope that it will be translated soon. If not in English, then maybe in Dutch, who knows. Uh, it would be more than worth it. So we, were very, we are very happy, uh, Severin, that you could... And that, you, that you could accept our invitation, and I give the floor to you. Good evening. I am very, very happy to be here with you. So, first and foremost, I would like to thank Philippe Van Otter and Hanuta de Groot for this invitation. It's a really a great honor for me to be with you. Uh, tonight I would like to speak about African philosophy in a specific way. I will not relate the history of African philosophy, but I would like to distinguish how African philosophies can help us to think, to rethink our world and how they can help us to make world together. It seems to me also that African philosophies can help us to rethink Western modernity in order to move on from it. I would like to begin with an observation about our contemporaneity. We have never been so linked each other as we are nowadays. The internet has reduced distances from a technical point of view, we can easily speak with someone living in another part of the globe. A natural disaster occurs in Japan, for example, and you know it immediately by Twitter, Facebook, TV, and so on. But parad paradoxically, in our day life, we have never been so lonely. There are more and more nuclear families Solidarity is attacked from all sides. Trade unions seem more and more weak. Workers are more and more isolated. The wealth gap is more and more important, and so on. 
what we can observe is that our societies are confronted to a crisis, which is a crisis of disconnecting. Globalization is a disconnecting system for which a part of the population is useless for its performance. And the Cameroonian philosopher, Achille Bembe, reveals how this system deals with this population by planning its loss, its elimination. He speaks about a back becoming of the world, a black becoming of the world, but what does it mean? In his book, Critique of the Black Reason, he traces the conjunction of blackness with the biological fiction of race, and he theorizes black reason as a collection of discourses and practices that equated blackness with the non-human in order to uphold forms of oppressions. Achille Bembe argues that this equation of blackness, which is a construction with a non-human, will serve as a template for all new forms of exclusion. This definition of the black reason can equally apply to any other group. Historically, black people as slaves were useful to nourish the capitalist system, which built itself on the slave trade and slavery. But nowadays, slavery is replaced by a new category of population that globalization no longer needs for its performance because of robotization and development of technology. So, globalization plans its loss. But the crisis we have to deal with is also an ethical crisis because we are not able to take care of those who suffer, especially if they are foreigners. We have broken the link which connected us to humanity by considering that a part of it is barbarian. This disconnecting situation can also be perceived in our relation to nature. Ecological crisis is born out of our break with nature. Modern Western man has broken his link with nature. It seems to me that thinking with Africa through African philosophers can be useful to enrich our thought to see in which way we can solve this disconnecting crisis, since some of them offer a relational perspective, a relational rationality. What I would like to suggest is to reflect by drawing on African philosophies our conception of our social life and to enlarge this letter to the living, to all the living beings in order to profile a desirable future. But in order to realize it, I believe that it is necessary to reconsider Western modernity because it will help us to understand where we are come from, who we are, in order to distinguish what we have to rethink for a better togetherness, for a better collective life. The ecological crisis has made us aware of the necessity to rethink our link to nature and the limits of the Bacon-Descartes model according to which human is master of nature. Modernity has extracted Western man from nature. This new Western man has transformed nature into, into an exploitative resource and in the same movement, he decided to conquer the world. What is interesting to outline is that one of the justifications for colonization in legal manuals was a non-exploitation of the land by local populations. As early as 19... Uh, excuse me. Uh, as early as 1492, 
colonization is first and foremost the violent, extreme, total monopolization of natural commons. This model has led to an outrageous exploitation of nature, to an uncontrolled pillage, and has fostered the industrial and capitalist development of the Western world. And last, it has led to the Anthropocene or Capitalocene. <coughs> Western modernity broke its link with environment and with the rest of humanity in an exploitative relationship. It is the contrary of wanting to make world, to make worlds, to make the world. The question is, how can we think a way of anchoring to the earth that is nourishing and that is not exploiting, and that permits us to relink ourselves to others in order to build a shared world. Building a shared world is wanting that everybody can live off the land and can share everything the land offers us. According to Kwasi Viredu, who is a Ghanaian philosopher, in traditional African cultures, the land belongs not to the individuals, but to the whole clans, and individuals only have rights of use that they are obligated to exercise considerately so as not to render nugatory the similar rights of future members of the clan. This questions the very concept of property on which a global capitalist system builds itself. Nelson Mandela would transform the notion of Ubuntu that we can translate by, by I am because we are in a philosophical concept explained during his trial in 1964 that his ideal of a classless society came from his reading of Marx, but also, I quote him, from my admiration of the structure and organization of early African societies in this country. The land, then the main means of production, belonged to the tribe. They were no rich or poor, and there was no exploitation. Private ownership does not exist in this system. Kwasi Viredu explains that the external world that the traditional African recognizes includes other human beings and living and non-living beings as well as, as extra-human beings of very grades of power and intelligence ranging from the superhuman to the subhuman. All these are regarded as regular parts of the world order. There is therefore no question of trying to control or dominate this whole scheme of things and beings. What are the consequences of this? Community must be enlarged to encompass not only the ancestors and the not yet born, but also all the living and non-living beings. There are obligations to both ancestors and descendants which motivates environmental carefulness, all things being equal, said Viredu. There is a real importance of the rights of those who are not yet born. This is not theoretical. This is practical and defines both a praxis and an ethics. This is the reason why the Kenyan philosopher Henry Odera Uruka, I quote him, argues for an eco-philosophical approach which recognizes the totality of spatial, temporal, spiritual, and other interlinkages in nature because there is a need for a shift towards a new epistemological outlook in which humankind is viewed as part of a complex and systematic totality of nature. These are two conceptions of nature 
which imply two conceptions of ethics. One, the Western one, is anthropocentric. The other, the African one, is ecocentric. This ecocentric conception supposes to recognize the importance of relationship. I would like again to allude to Western modernity. What we have to keep in mind is that Western modernity is also the period during which Copernicus dissented universe by discovering heliocentrism. Humanity was no more at the earth of the cosmos. Affects that Western man has had difficulties to accept. Indeed, despite of this discovery, the West has never been really heliocentric. A process of withdrawal from the cosmos, from a philosophical point of view, was developed in the West during the period of so-called modernity, which, write Emanuele Coccia, identified itself with the appeal of the Earth at the expense of the stars, with a ever deeper affirmation of the Earth as a definitive horizon of our existence and of all knowledge. But if we peer the cosmos, we can see the very importance of relation. I would like to take the example of the virtual particles. These virtual particles go back and forth between stable particles. And thanks to this movement, they transmit, for example, the nuclear power, the nuclear force. This is a real, there is a real power of the virtual. And what these virtual particles teach us is that things occur only in the interaction. The world is creating itself in the interaction. This is what Buddhism suggests with the concept of vacuity. This invites us to think about a relational ontology and a relational cosmology. According to Odera Uruka, we have to adopt a holistic outlook in which everything is related to everything else. This interrelatedness requires a corresponding philosophical approach that looks at nature in its totality and derives from it a fix that reflects this outlook. This is a way of constructing an eco-philosophy. Contrary to environmental studies, which have so far restricted themselves to the study of the Earth at atmosphere, says Odera Uruka, eco-philosophy must include the totality of born human-made as well as non human made philosophy about nature and the totality of the universe. The ecole philosophy invites us to found a new ethics which would take into account the complexity and totality of nature. This would be a parental earth ethics. This implies to take care of the human beings as well as the non-human beings. Parental Earth Ethics is for Odera Uruka, a basis ethics that would offer a motivation for both a global environmental concern and a global redistribution of the wealth of nations. In the second half of the 20th century, African philosophy built and defined itself in opposition to African cosmologies to animism, and yet it could be extremely fertile to explore these traditional philosophies in that, according to the Senegalese thinker Felwinsar in Afrotopia, the conception of the universe that is visible in a wide variety of African knowledge and practices is that of a cosmos thought as a great living thing. It is a whole 
of which man is an emanation, one living being amongst others. Man is considered as a symbolic operator licking heaven and earth. The ritual of repairing the earth constitutes one of the most significant symbolic acts in a realization of this responsibility. They could certainly provide us with a rich source of material that we need to offer a post-humanist thought, which is, and this is not a paradox, would allow us to accomplish our humanity in that becoming human would bring us back to helping life and every life force grow. To succeed in, in making a world is to achieve one's humanization, not only for humanity, but for everything living, and to inscribe oneself into a cosmology of emergence. From this point, of, from this point on, the in common is our horizon, that which we should all reach out towards. This obliges us to sketch out an ethic of relation which reinforces being and allows us to realize ourselves fully. That is to say, not to head towards greeting havings, but towards better being, just as the Senegalese philosopher Suleiman Bashir Dian invite us to do in his book Bergson Postcolonial in a world to fulfill ourselves spiritually. This vitalist ontology is present in Bantu, Dongon, Serer cultures insisting on an ethics of action. We must act according to everything that reinforces vital force. Hero is a lessening of life force. The good, the truth, is what saved from the destruction as explained it the Senegalese philosopher Abdullah Eliman Khan. This has consequences on social relations. Even in social relations, we have to behave in order to reinforce your life force but also that one of the society. You are not an individual being living alone. You live with others and you depend on them as they depend on you, and this since your birth. I mentioned the concept of Ubuntu a few minutes ago. I would like to go over that. Ubuntu comprehends the individual in his relation with others. That social cogito teaches us that community is not a sum of scattered individuals. It is a group through the links that it creates and nourishes that nurtures the power to act. Community is not a given, but a structure that needs to be constantly fed and reinforced as it evolves and becomes exposed to new elements. This praxis rests on an in common that must be built. This implies developing an ethics of participation and solidarity. In his essay, Mandela, a philosophy in acts, Jean-Paul Jouari explains that Ubuntu, which could be translated, as I said, as I am because we are, invites us to privilege the common interest over that of our individuality in all circumstances and to strive always to identify with others, even with their feelings of hostility, in order to regulate one's own life. This principle, he writes, indeed possesses a social essence of all individual persons, just like Plato at the beginning of the Republic, Aristotle in politics, man is a political animal, Epicurus in his letter to Menicius, since the 
them that wrongs our desires in the pursuit of personal happiness also passes through honesty and justice. Not to forget Spinoza, who in his ethics demonstrates that in order to attain happiness, nothing is more useful that man than another man guided by reason. It suggests respect for another's humanity, insofar as it poses the irreducible value of human life. And it infers an ethics that rests on the preeminence of reparation and on understanding of a punishment, which very concretely supposes the continuous search for conciliation and the refusal of revenge in the conflict management. We can find a perfect example of this in the politics of Nelson Mandela, as demonstrated by Jean-Paul Jouary. Madiba understood that he could not found a fair post-apartheid society without involving former executioners. To care for society is to care for its victims and to take care of its executioners. We find this idea in different forms of traditional African justice, such as the Kachasha in Rwanda, where in the aftermath of the genocide, discussion played a central role. Through the narration of deeds and acts, it was aimed at facilitating identification with the suffering of the victims by provoking shame in those who caused it. It was a matter of recreating foundations for a peaceful society without erasing the crime that has been committed from memory or abandoning the cause for truth and rather by developing the condition for an active citizenship and burned as far as possible of vengeful feelings and which is necessary for the construction of a true democracy. This is what the Cameroonian philosopher Jean Godefroy Bidima proposes in his essay, La Palabre, the legal authority of speech, in which he explains that in Palabre, the rights of the community do not supplant those of the individual, even if justice bears a cathartic function that comprises the healing of the collective and the individual. It seeks to rehabilitate the other, be they the victim or the guilty party, and to recognize them as such as a full member of society. Here we find what the notion of Ubuntu suggests. The logic of compensation based on a distributive justice that seeks to compensate the wrongs suffered mathematically and within a mercantile relation. You must pay your debt. Conflicts with the logic of compensation based on an asymmetrical justice which apprehends the future and seeks to patch up the broken link. In the end, it is not so different from what Paul Ricoeur writes about the just when he explains that reparation of the broken social bond is not conceivable without mutual recognition. At the end of the trio, the winner must always be able to recognize the loser as a legal entity. The latter, in turn, must recognize that the sentence is not an act of violence, but of recognition. It is a question of rehabilitating the other and reestablishing every party's public and self-esteem. Justice must ensure that the honor of the victim but also that of the losing party is preserved. 
Jean Godefroy Bidema explains that there are two ways of understanding palabre. The first one, I quote him, defines it as a movement that brings violence to an old after heated debate. It leads conflicting individuals towards consensus. In palabre, according to this perspective, one exercises disagreement in order to foster unity and create a people united and indivisible. The second one is the apparatic palabre, which does not resolve a conflict but suspend it and invest in dissensus. Bidema explains that dissensus should be an all encompassing element that frames every relation to the political, because beginning from the existence of desire, subjects return to divergent relationship at the heart of the, a common political space. Rather than harmony, this kind of palabre contributes to a compromise, <coughs> temporary agreements that respect particularities and alterity. I quote him, in the ideology of consensus-driven palabre, one proceed towards a resolution of conflicts, whereas in the apparatic palabre, conflict is only suspended. What is interesting with the apparatic palabre is that it allows us to transform tension into a positive thing to preserve the multiple, the differences, the diverse. The diverse. This apparatic palabre permits to construct collective life despite the census and upon it. Bidima writes that palabre as a formation of a discourse, of codes, and of networks constitutes the place where human coexistence is made concrete. It does not define collective life, but draws a frame around it. In fact, Palabre is a public space in which a soul constructs a meaning. The meaning is what relinks, what binds together a community. This public space that the apoetic palab construct is that one which allows to reinforce the collective life, the individual's vital force and the community's vital force, and it allows to make the individuals become citizens. It is thus a question of privileging the relation that allows to be related without being tied together, which emancipates and does not stifle. Suleiman Bashir Diagne, in Leopold Sedar Sangor, L'art africain comme philosophie, writes, We can, the Yardin de Chardin tells us, follow the path of egoism, which consists of only thinking that movement has attained its sense with oneself, whether one is an individual or a nation. This egoism, parent of all ethnocentrism, carries within itself domination and colonization. We can, on the other hand, fully grasp the meaning of being born and developing as a function of a cosmic stream and thus see the responsibility of having to continue the effort to bring about more life, more being, by extending towards ever greater unity the generative forces of the world. Humanizing ourselves is world-making, building a world through sharing. It is the total opposite of a process of globalization, which does not in fact make world, but disconnects 
and divides, exploiting the earth and people and imposing an overbearing universal that standardizes instead of connecting. With Sangor, as with Thea de Sharda, we find a cosmic dimension to dialogue between cultures that is a dialogue which respects differences and allows for more life, more being. In Leopold Seda Sangor, L'Art Africain comme Philosophie, Suleiman Bashirdian writes, for a dialogue between cultures to only be possible when oriented by life force, this is incarnated, for example, in human rights philosophy that teaches them that in order to meet one another, we need to know how to decenter ourselves and to thus go beyond egotisms and soliloquies. That is what, what read together, often in terms or images that are close to one another. Teilhard de Chardin and Iqbal Se and Sangor with them. This vitalist philosophy, which is present in many African cultures, demanding an ethics of action, according to which acting must help to increase life force, evolving that which lessens the élan vital. Real, realizing one's humanity, this is the stepping outside the confines of the I in order to make world. Because I am linked to the other, I allow myself to be overwhelmed by myself through him. I no longer position the other in the place of object, of conquest and of possession. But I set him up as subject, facing me at once as an authority of an adjective and source of humanity, like me, as I find that I am through him overwhelmed by myself. Thinking collective life as it must reinforce life and not annihilate it, as we saw with Ubuntu and the Palam, is what allows the possible happen to direct it toward more being. It is also what can help us to think movement towards more being. Reinforcing life is working for the future, otherwise we are nihilistic. On the contrary, it is formulating a fault of foresight in order to give time a political dimension and to build a society and a citizenship from a common future possible and desirable. Working for the future revitalizes politics. Wanting to reinforce life is anchoring oneself in a cosmology of emergence and seeking to open the future to the possible. For Jean Godefroy Bidima, thinking about the possible action is to conceive the Kairos opportunity. That is to say the time of good opportunities, the one that, that links the not yet and the nevermore. The time of the possible is not a succession of past, present and future but it is composed of tendencies and latencies, of accomplished and unfulfilled, of tension and distension, of potentialities, of daring. With Kairos, we bind more than ever present and future by melting them into one another. It is because we size the right moment, here and now, that we build the future and allow the potential to happen. Working for the future is refusing the inevitable, the repetition of the same, but it is projecting oneself, living in creation, and leaking the possible to 
hope and against a future of all dystopias, desiring and laying the foundation of a utopian future. Allowing the different to express oneself is understanding that the different is not what separates, but what is common to us. Building the in common is working the potentialities for reinforcement of the life, a better living together and clearing a horizon not so much utopian as maybe pluritopic. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, uh, I forgot when I was giving my introduction, I forgot my, my book in, uh, to show the book. So this is the book I was talking about, Philosophie, Philosophie Africaine. Um, okay, so there is one first question that I would like to ask. That's the following. Um, in your very interesting and thoughtful paper. Um, what struck me is that you present African philosophy as a kind of uh, alternative or a kind of solution for the problems our uh, contemporary societies are confronted with that are problems of our own European Western making. And one could then have quite easily the impression, well, you have on the one hand European philosophy, created lots of problems, we have to get rid of it. And we have an alternative, we will look at African uh, culture, African philosophy. But then, so that could be, so that would be one possibility, if I understand uh, you well. But then, I'm a bit, a bit, how would I say that, a bit uh, puzzled, because at the same time, um, do the philosophers, the African philosophers you mentioned in your talk, I think of Diagne, I think also of, of I think of, of Felwin Sarr and so on, they not only refer to Western and European philosophy themselves in the articulation of their thought, but at the same time, they sometimes develop insights that you also find in some Western uh, philosophies. So another, and so my question would be, what, you do, what, what, would you, what do you think of the, uh, how would I say that, of the opposition I'm creating here? So another approach then could be, yes, but of course, African philosophy, the African heritage, confronts European philosophy with its own shortcomings, with its... Uh, with its, uh, well, it, it, it confronts us with the limitations that, mm. that, are char that characterize that tradition. But at the same time, it uh, helps us to mobilize, if I uh, can use that expression, to mobilize the possibilities, forgotten or hidden possibilities of our own tradition um, that would allow us to overcome the problems that we created. So that, uh, that on the one hand, and on the other hand, of course, that would make possible a fruitful dialogue between these traditions. Because if you just say it's one against the other, or one replaces the other, that's not a dialogue. Eh? That, that's just saying, okay, uh, we have to get rid of one thing and we replace it by something else. So it seems to me that there are two, at least two, uh, ways of approaching the relation between European and, and uh, uh, African philosophy. So my question to you then is, what would you uh, reply to this uh, layman's view? Um, usually, uh, in the West, we we philosophize uh, between us, and uh, we forget that the world is not only the West, and. I asked me why, as a Western philosopher, um, I don't read, I don't go towards 
other philosophies, other philosophers who come from different uh, parts of the world. And discussion is easier when you are in the same culture. But I think that maybe dialogue is more rich, is more interesting if you dialogue with something, with someone um, who came from, uh, we came with an, another culture, another philosophical background, and maybe it permits us to, to decenter ourselves, to, to make a detour by the other, to come after and to refresh our conception of philosophy, of politics, of democracy. It is by the confrontation that you enrich your reflection. And it is, it is a, always a pity when you see that in French university there is no uh, teaching on African philosophies. And there is no possibility for scholars, for students, to learn about African philosophies. And it was a question for me, and you can't answer to this question if you don't think about colonization. It is a heritage, a colonial heritage that we have, and we have to confront confront ourselves to this heritage. And usually when we speak about um, the necessity of decolonizing our mentalities, of decolonizing knowledge, we think about it as it was an African imperative, but it is also a Western imperative, because colonization transforms the colonized people, but also transform us. We, we, we have to keep in mind that we come from a, a next colonial uh, society, a next colonial nation uh, and structure, and we inherited of this background. And from this background, we thought that philosophy was only a Western thing, that you, we even thought, think that philosophy is a Western creation. But it is stupid. Philosophy is everywhere where there is humanity. So it interests me to go uh, in African text to see what African philosophers have to say, have to teach me. And maybe it can enrich ourselves. And what is very in, uh, interesting is to see that this kind of intercultural philosophy, intercultural practice of philosophy, is what African philosophers have always done. Their African philosopher was um, discussed each other with different cultures. In Tombuktu, for example, the, there were a lot of philosophers coming from different parts of the world and they discussed each other in what we call together, today it, Ethiopia. Um, we translate Aristotle in uh, Ethiopia in the maybe five or six century of this era. So it is interesting to remember this and to see that this practice of philosophy is a practice of the encounter, of meeting, of exchanging. And um, contemporary philosophers, African philosophers, um, use Western concept if they think that they need of it. And they use traditional concept if it's better for them to think about African philosophies. And I think that we can, if it's better for us in the West, 
to rethink the political situation, to rethink how we can make a society more um, with more solidarity. If it's useful to 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 think with the Ubuntu concept, so let's do it. And in, in that along along that line. <laughs> <laughs> Along that line, because what 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 um, what strikes me, what struck me in your, uh, I, I well, I'm not, I'm no longer. Well, you can see that I'm no longer 40 years. So, I I, I was raised in in a different. Sometimes I think in a different era, and so for instance, when we speak about democracy, I. Uh, I remember the way when I went to school, when I when when, when I studied and so on, etc. Uh, it was as if, uh, and and that's basically how it was transmitted to us, as if as if, uh, for instance, Africa, the history of Africa started, I don't know, uh, in the beginning of the of, of 14th or 15th century, mm. and there was nothing, and we didn't know anything uh, of of what what went on before that, and which is a rich and, and a very interesting history, obviously. You mentioned uh, also philosophically. And one of the linked to that was the idea that actually, for instance, democracy would be something like a Western mm. invention. We invented, we, the West, uh, invented uh, democracy. Now, the, um, in your, from your talk, I, 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 uh, one of the things I, I remember, one of the things I also appreciated, of course, and I <laughs> realize I'm not alone, um, is precisely this, 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 this idea of palabre. Uh, re related to the idea yes. of Ubuntu. Now, my question then to you would be there, what exactly would you, beyond the the explanation of what Ubuntu and what what uh, the, the idea of, of, of Palabra uh, entails, in what respect would you, in what, what of these ideas do you think would, uh, would be useful, interesting for us, uh, and for us, I mean, uh, in the European Western context, what what values and what what uh, what aspects of it would would be interesting for us, for our way of understanding democracy? So, so how how would you uh, relate this 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 these these two types of of, of uh, social existence? Mm. Yes, we. In the West, we say that uh, democracy or human rights uh, or philosophy <laughs> is a Western speciality that is universal and uh, that we have to export uh, in the world because the others are, have, I don't know how to say it, but uh, we have the cynicism of thinking that we have to we have to learn to teach to the other what they have to do uh, because we have a complex of superiority. And, uh, but what is interesting, if uh, you read African philosophies and African philosophers, you by these examples of Palabre or of Ubuntu, uh, we can say that uh, there is a reflection about democracy, about how to to live together and to share the the power, the richness, the wealth, and um, even if the world of democracy is not present, in fact, it is a manner of acting in a de democratic way, and we think in the West there is one model, one kind of democracy, which is a democracy by elections. But we can impose election in uh, some countries. It will not, uh, it can, maybe, you will not have a democracy. Um, Paul Bia is elected by, enfin, is, there are some elections, but is here from maybe 20, 30 years, 30 years and more, 36 years. Mm -hmm. So we have a democratic system, but it is not a democracy. We have to distinguish between the form and what it is concretely. And uh, we can 
also think, keep something in mind that it is a history, the history of humanity teaches that men want to be free everywhere he is. It is, liberty is not something specific to the waste. So people everywhere they live, in Asia or in Africa, in Latin America, they struggle for their rights, they struggle for their freedom, but they use different ways in, in function of their culture, of the, the meaning of the society, of, of the, their way of appreciating life and ethics. And you, you can have democracy even if the world doesn't exist. And for example, for the human rights, we usually said it is a European or Western invention, but there is a famous example in Africa, which is, the, I don't know in English how you say it, the, la charte du monde, which is a, something from the 13th century, in which? 13. 13th 13. 13. century, mm -hmm. thank you. <laughs> uh, 12, yeah, 36, yeah. I think, something like that, in which there is the description of what is the right of each human and which is the basis for a, a society of solidarity, of sharing. And we have lessons here from every, every of us. Mm -hmm.